there's a story that I tell repetitively about Lev where he's driving on the road, sees the sirens come on in back of him, you know, the rear view mirror, realizes, you know, the cops are after him. So he's got his sunglasses on and he pulls over, you know, eventually to the side of the road and the cop comes up to the window. He doesn't even turn to look at the cop and he rolls down the window and the cop says, do you know how fast you are going? And Uncle Liv says, thank you for your service, officer. You're doing a wonderful job. There's nothing to worry about. I'm Batman. One, two, three, eight. When I think of Livingston, I think about uh, being in his plane. I just thought, wow, this is... This is such a unique experience. I'm never gonna experience anything like this again. In the sky, Livingston Taylor. My roommate took Livingston Taylor's first class, and um, she came in and she's like, oh, I have to perform again today. She's always really stressed out about the performances, and she's like, you have to take this class. And I looked into it, and I was like, where has this guy been all my life? I met with Livingston for lunch at the Berkeley cafeteria. Within 45 seconds, he says, what, what is this? What's going on here? And the, he, he was literally the first person in my whole life to be that, have that much courage and love. Mr. Taylor, I think he sees the world through rose-tinted glasses, but they're not quite rose-tinted, but rather rainbow? He just sort of sees everything in brighter colors. A favor us for the tune, please. Giving your all to others and it all comes back to you. When do you know when it's time, when all the masses are, are yeah. saying no, yeah. and you feel to your gut 99% yes? God, that's a great question. I love you walking towards your own truth. Above all else, that rules above everything else. Who gives a rat's butt if it's successful? if you're walking towards your own truth. And guys, if there's a God in heaven, that's what I'm, I would be training you to do. I see you with her, and it crushes me inside. Wait a minute. Inside! Oh! Livingston Taylor is my one of my younger brothers. So I was 15 months when he arrived on my uh, on my planet, and uh, uh, life has never been the same. So I was back down in North Carolina, essentially 1952, 
and uh, stayed there until I was uh, almost 16. Academics were not going to be an option for me. I just didn't do well in school. I was a curious enough lad, but um, I knew I had to have a skill. I want you gnarly and alive. After the nuclear blast devastates all, I want to see the first head poking up is yours going. That was a tough one. <laughs> Whew. Let's go. Okay, let's go move. I practiced my guitar by 16, early 17. I was writing songs by late uh, uh, 17, uh, uh, I was doing shows, I was playing uh, in coffee houses, open mic nights, that kind of thing. And by early 18, I discovered that I really could get and hold an audience. People started paying me to make music. I remember it was, I think, probably 1969, where um, I wound up having him play as an opening act, because in those days, <laughs> the headliner didn't necessarily pick it, so we did everything. And I had him play, and he did, you know, incredibly well. I think the first time I, I met him, uh, I knew of him, but had never seen him work. And I think he knew me, uh, and had never seen me work. And uh, we hit it off really well. It was fun. But I made the mistake of saying backstage when, during sound check, I said, Liv, I thought they might want to you know, book this as Brothers Of. And he said, don't go there. So I had been in Nashville, Tennessee, and I had been recording with a group of great musicians. And I've been playing them all those, uh, all those intricate marijuana chords I've learned. And I thought to myself, well, I better play him something that goes down pretty easy. So in the key of G, right here. very much his own person and um, he doesn't require others. He would be fine on a desert island. He'd be fine in a house in the woods in, the, in a storm. He flies an airplane and probably a big part of his identity is being a pilot. And he loves his plane. It's a small Cessna one engine. He's flown me down to the vineyard a number of times. Let's go fly. I've learned how. We'll stick out our arms and run real fast. Pick up your feet and while you're headed for the blue, things get clear. And that special place we tried to find is now some house so near. What 
what a way to be with you Hand in hand above the clouds I have loved you quite forever And now I'm saying it right out loud What a kick to open our eyes And watch the world go drifting on Slap my seat and wiggle my feet With you I belong I'm born and raised in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which is where uh, Livingston is from as well. Started all about learning how to put structure and form, organization, rhythm to my play-by-ear improvise overall mentality about life and music. Own who you are, scars and all. We all have scars of, of varying degrees and varying manifestations, be they emotional, physical, and a big part of life I think I learned from Livingston. Berkeley College of Music and started lecturing periodically in the 80s, two, three times. And in 1988, a guy, uh, 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 a department chair named Rob Rose, asked if I would teach a course on performance. He said, Livingston, will you teach a course? Yes. In spite of being a lousy student, I love teaching. I love being uh, with students. I, I love the exploration that takes part in that environment. And so I was on that like a tick on a dog. Like most of us, we come to our music, and we come to our music with a ferocity because so many of us have these pieces that are of us that are completed by making music. It is our creativity that overcomes our insecurity, that overcomes our loneliness, that allows us to be in communication. It gives us a vehicle to see and be seen. are doing? Your biggest challenge, especially being an instrumentalist without a voice instrument, is going to be working on your, as he's been trying to get across, is your vulnerability and creating that window that we can peek in and see that genius. And so when I see you play with that beautiful skill and I see you in a state of joy and I see you struggling with the music as a backdrop, to see and be close. It makes me feel very good indeed, Amir. And I want to thank you for that effort on our behalf. I love you. And we've all been to his class because he's always, he's always, you know, teaching in some respect. It's so good, guys. The adventure is so good. It's a tricky thing to, to, uh, to navigate the space you're in. And that's part of what I really admire about Livingston. Uh, 
and it's a tougher job than I have because Harry now is an icon gone. There's always be those songs. James is very much bingo right here doing some of his best work ever. So as a brother, you got to find a space for yourself. And I think a couple of things have been very smart and, and really brave for him. The idea of teaching, is it 26, 28 years now at Berkeley and giving back is really admirable. His curiosity is insatiable. Um, <clears throat> his drive to understand is so, so deep. Um, as is the, the well f from which he quenches his thirst. We have come many miles to sing this song. And I hope that you'll sing along. We are the voice of the common man, marching for justice and an even hand. times of trouble, when no one else really was around, I would call Liv, and he would always be there for me. And what will you say when your granddaughter asks where you were? On the day when the women drew us out of the shade. I just find him always interesting. I could actually repeat some of his lectures uh, verbatim because he, he, he's a teacher. He will often switch on and give you his uh, Bernoulli principle lecture. Uh, but by the same token, um, you know, you always learn something when you're with Liv. Livingston is, um, is different. He said, you know, I have this thing about water. I said, yeah. He said, you know, I really like water. I said, yeah. So he called out, um, got one of those dowser guys to come, you know, with a stick. And so there's water here, whatever. And so, and the guy dug, and sure enough, came up with a well. And, um, and then Livingston had this whole elaborate, because it was a hill behind his house, a whole elaborate water system. He had water flowing from the top of the hill, down the hill, into a whole other pool. And so he created an entire, you know, sort of water world <laughs> around this property in Weston because he really liked water, you know. And that's a little different. I am not interested in uh, interesting human beings. I am interested in interested human beings. <laughs> I have the, the great pleasure of being his nephew, and uh, always have been, since I can remember. Never mind if you get through, but you are my Friday, my Friday. I make some money to spend on you, because you're so shiny, you're so shiny. Going to watch one of his concerts is just like going to see him teach one of his classes. It's a performance, it's a lecture, it's a lesson, it's a dissertation. Steel, steel plate. Think about 1854 and Henry Bessemer, an Englishman, inventing the Bessemer converter and finally you could get carbon out of steel. You could finally make steel on unthought of scale. He needs to know what everything, how everything's made and what everything's made out of. And you know, he won't just look at a trash can. He's got to know where the metal came from 
and how the plant, you know, pressed the material. Look at what we have just right here in this little speed up portico. Look at this machine here. Look at the steel that's in this. It's everywhere. Steel is omnipresent. It builds our buildings, it makes our cars, it makes our forklift. We went to see you at the cellar door, yeah. the cellar door yeah. in Georgetown. Yeah. She gave you a tiny little card to sign for me yeah. for my 20th birthday. Oh and I meant to bring it tonight. <laughs> I know. Because right. who thought I'd see you yeah. on the beach? Yeah. Yeah. And to let you see that I have loved you a really long time. And I'm really excited. Oh. <laughs> you know, I love playing. But what I particularly love, and I, I explain this to my students all the time, because because I look at them and I, and 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 they can't understand that what's, what's happening to us when we get nervous, when we get nervous on stage or in front of people. The, the problem is that for me to have a vision, a musical vision, and to ask and to interrupt your lives with my vision, it's a stunning act of hubris. Whenever we present ourselves in, in an environment where we're interrupting other people's lives, and so, uh, for, for a, and the problem is, you get ready to go on stage, you get ready to give that speech or that presentation or whatever it is, and you become gripped with the fear that you are not enough, that your presentation will not be enough, that they will uh, chastise you for having interrupted their lives. Who here gets nervous getting on stage? Um, um, uh, uh, And why, why do you get nervous? Any thoughts for me? Yeah. Feelings of inadequacy when you compare yourself to others? Yeah. Feelings of inadequacy because, face it, going on stage, you already know this. It's the most stunningly arrogant thing you can do. I love it when somebody says, oh, the audience wants to like you. <coughs> No, they don't. Are you high? They don't want to like you. They want you to leave them alone. Go away. I have a life. It's a good life. and I attended a little luncheon provost thing and Mr. Taylor was doing a small presentation at that meeting. Wait a minute, let's do that line again. What's the lyric there? The smile was a lifeboat I rode in and her shanties rang with truth like hymns. Oh, by the way, spectacular lyric writing. You're killing me. I lost a lot of it. In the uh, 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 in in your uh, delivery, okay. I don't want to. So if if you're having trouble singing it, then uh, uh, then speak it more than sing it. I cannot miss those lyrics. All right. right. The smile was a lifeboat I rode in, and the shanties rang with truth like hymns, and sailed to somewhere else to start again. Yeah. Well, all right. I'll leave you alone. Thank you. And the job that won't get done. Two weeks' basement yesterday, and a three-change bus ride home. The 
Hidden grail, the long hard day, not a thing to call your own. And the boy turns and asks his old dad, he says, Are you glad for the kind of life you've had? And he says, Life is good. Spring is in the air. You got your box in your pocket, a little bit of brill cream in your hair. The first tailor that I ever met was Livingston. And I met Livingston in 1970 or 69. I can't remember if it was 69 or 70. And Livingston and I sang a couple of songs together and we got together at his family's house in Chilmark to rehearse a, a few songs. And Livingston and I rehearsed about three or four songs. And then we sang them at Peter's, Peter, my brother's film festival theater. And uh, it was so terrific. It was so easy. I found Livingston was the perfect person to sing with. We were on a, on a tour, as I said, the last couple of years with a, a young female band as well named Eva, three, three really talented young women. And Livingston is not shy about helping them. Sometimes they thought it was helping, <laughs> you know, because he will nail you and say, wait, 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 articulate or hit that note or why are you saying that on stage? So he was, he's always been incredibly generous with his stage, with, for everybody, for students. He always sort of, you know, pulls you up. I need her vocal here, please. former student of mine. Uh, actually, one of, uh, one of my... She survived. Well, survived, I should say, that um, uh, one of my... Uh, one of the ones I like to brag on most. Let's get Chelsea back out here again. travel, what's your income stream, are you married, are you in a, a permanent <laughs> relationship? You, uh, this is Livingston uh, picking on me. Okay, no, so, I know, just, I know, it's, it's just, just reality. I, I, I really, I just, <laughs>
think I've been playing with Livingston for probably six years. Fifteen minutes on the phone is all you had. I went to school for a few years at Berkeley, took time off, and then went back and finished. And between those two times, um, I was talking with a really good friend of mine who who has been a big part of my musical career and and she mentioned Livingston at one point and said what do you think about trying to reach out to him again since he took his class and seeing if you know if maybe he could give you some pointers and met up with Livingston and sat down with him and he you know basically tore me apart for about I don't know two or three hours and uh and something that he said to me for a long time, and I think this is sort of a common theme, is it doesn't matter to me if you decide you don't want to do these things, but if you would like to get better, this is what you need to fix. I've got nothing left to say, no demands, I never did. And so I did. And then he tore me apart again, and I did it again and again and again and again. And after, um, after at least a few months, if not a year, he offered for me to come and, and play a show with him. This is mainly going out uh, uh, to males, but uh, I, I want to instruct, uh, suggest to you males why you put on the bow tie. You don't put it on to put it on, you put it on to take it off, because you will be out with the lovely person, correct, and you will have spent an evening with this lovely person, you will get to, you will find yourself at some point in a place of relative privacy. And you want to look at that person, you want to look into their eyes, and you then want to say, being with you tonight has been one of the remarkable events in my life. And I need to tell you, <laughs> How grateful I am to have been graced by your presence. 26, and I released three odd records I had done very well, and then my career was sort of winding down as careers are wont to do. I wasn't making very much money. Uh, I had a stack of bills. I was really questioning whether I wanted to stay as a musician and whether that was going to be viable for me for the rest of my life. Um, I got a phone call from Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull. I remember lots of times we played together in the early 70s, and perhaps most significantly, after a show in Chicago, we took off to a to the Playboy Club. You were desperate to go and visit a Playboy Club and I had to come and hold your hand. It was like, except probably you were holding my hand too because we were very nervous, a couple of young kids uh, out and about on the town. And uh, But we, we, our nerves were soothed when a very, very helpful and nice young lady with a beautifully, spotlessly white, fluffy tail came over and took good care of us. And we sent had a couple of beers and uh, I can't remember what happened after that, but... And he called me up and he said, Livingston, I'm not feeling terribly well. Will you open for me at Madison Square Garden? And I said, Ian, thank you for that. But if I delay your New York's audience's reunion with you, they will kill me. You walk on stage 
and you say to a whole group of people who didn't ask you to be there, I want, I want you to stop what you're doing. I want you to pay attention to me, and then the panic strikes that you may not be enough. Who's had that panic? Guess what? You may not be enough. And I got up close to the microphone on this first night, and I looked at them and I said, let me tell you something in this cavernous hall, and it did it, boom. Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull are going to be here in a few minutes, and they're going to be fantastic. <sighs> and as that cheer died down, I then said, but right now, I'm here. And if you don't like it, you can get the out. Knock it off. How dare you? How dare you interrupt my life and then ask if it's okay that you interrupt my life? Because I got the answer for you. No, go away. And then I looked up and a long neck beer bottle thrown from behind spun past my head, and it spun past my head and into my audience. And it was clear to me that my presence on stage was putting this audience in jeopardy. I stopped the strings, and for one of the only times in my career, I looked at that crowd, and I said, it will not be possible to continue tonight. And I left. See you at 10.30 next Friday, usual time, usual place, the Dancing Bear Club down on Spruce Street. Don't be late. guitar player because playing in front of a live crowd, playing in front of a large crowd of people, uh, there's something about that, that feeling that gives you no, it's not compared to any other high in your life. <laughs> uh, here's something I want you to experiment with. Yeah. Um, uh, give me just a tiny amount of volume in here, just, just the slightest amount. And I want you to play on that book. Okay. Yeah, good, that's yeah. fine. No, no, much softer than that, really? much quieter, much quieter. Without Humoring me. Without, no, we can have the distortion. I just want it really, really, barely. Yeah, there we go. The audience. The audience does not need us. One of the most powerful things that Livingston talks about is, is about how, how to hold your audience and how to know that it's not your job to be nervous and that it is all about the crowd. But the best thing about him is to my mind, is his joy on stage. He never forgets that, uh, and he said this to me, uh, he says, you know, the audience doesn't need you half as much as you need them. He would say to pay attention to the people at the back of the, at the, back of the room because they're the people that can leave the room the easiest and you want to hold their attention and, and be as present with them as you are with the people in the front row. In order to be lifted onto Mount Olympus, 
as Mr. Taylor is so fond of saying, you must have the mortals under you. You're clinging to the fact that you could be one of your generation's creators and be treated as one of their gods. By the way, my brother is a singer named James Taylor. Have any of you heard of him before? Uh, uh, James was playing this summer. Uh, I'm 65. James is um, 68, by the way, a, a fact I never tire of reminding him. I think, if anything, the, the, the bond is maybe stronger between the two of them than it is in a lot of families. Uh, because they've been through very similar experiences, you know, since childhood and in their careers in a lot of ways. He's got a more difficult situation because James is alive and well and fabulous. And Harry's gone. He played with Jackson Brown at Fenway Park. How many tickets is that? 35,000, something like that. Were they coming and seeing my brother because he's a burning sex engine? <laughs> and he, and we, he's talked to, to me, he says, you know, people say how, how hard it must be for me to be James's brother or you to be Harry's brother. But you know, James has, in some ways, has a much tougher gig than I do. Sometimes he can't walk down the street. He says, and I've made a wonderful living, made a career, played my music, taught a lot of kids, and I, and I can go to the grocery store by myself and nobody bugs me. And I think that we're, you and I are pretty lucky, Tom, in that way. I believe that being on stage and asking people to interrupt their lives and follow your vision is sacred, it is honorable, their attention is this stunning gift. Do not stand up here and expect these people to see you and finance your vision if you don't see them. And sometimes you'll play to 500 people and 497 of them will not want, want what you offer. But three will, and they will be yours from then on. I'm talking about a career where you go on stage not to be seen. You go on stage to see. Now they're free to be in the proximity of the white hot passion of your content. And you hold them. And then they'll laugh and then they'll cry like babies. That's what this course is all about. Any questions so far? I, I've heard that song, that Olympic song, uh, I don't know, you know, a hundred times maybe, I don't know, but it always cracks me up. He's hilarious. And he always delivers it like it's the first time. And here, for the United States of America, on freestyle guitar. <laughs> Livingston Taylor. <laughs> Well, Chip, Livingston's doing a little shuffle here in A major. Seems to be going pretty smoothly. Now, he's scheduled to go to the four chord. But after what happened at the Nationals in Paramus, you got to think he's not going to risk it here tonight. No, wait a minute. No, I am wrong. He's going to go for it. All right, he's got a difficult triplet maneuver up the neck. He's going to have to nail this. He stuck it! Oh. Chip tonight, living since truly El Nino. You know, these guitar players are so popular around the Olympic Village. Their van pulls up, they go up to their rooms, they unpack their bags, and the party begins. No, no, you're right. You're right. With the proposed drug tests for next year, I expect a lot of these guys will not be back again. OK, 
a little retro disco on the five chord. This should certainly help with the Eastern European judges. You know, Chip, the entire Olympic community is just buzzing about the chances for Livingston and James in the pairs competition. Heck, if Leo Kotke hadn't broken the thumbnail, I don't think Livingston would be here at all. All right, here comes the dismount. Chip is right on the bubble here. No chance of getting the gold from Carlos Santana. But if he can stick this ending, might sneak in for a medal. He's going to have to nail the dismount. Here he comes. He knows how to do all kinds of things that he's taught himself to do. And one of the things I love about Liv is that, you know, he'll, he'll be the first to tell you that school and he didn't really mix that well. Livingston is a, is, a, is a teacher and he's always taught. And he teaches you wherever you are and whatever you're doing and, and whatever you're doing it about. He's fixed ceilings in this house for me. He said, you know, you've got a bad pipe in that ceiling. And then all of a sudden the next thing I know, an ax will have gone through the ceiling and he'll be fixing a pipe. He won't be around for the reconstruction of the ceiling, but he'll he'll have fixed the pipe. A little lesson from me. I learned so much in the absence of her touch. I got a PhD in doing it. Why is this thing going to actually fly? Here in lonely school, and that's the fact that it's a one-word test. And the correct answer is yes, yes, yes. I love the boss. How did you know? It's like one of my favorite things. It's been an ongoing um, uh, metamorphosis uh, uh, seeing my students tweaking year after year, developing little details here and there. I do an exercise in my class where I have the, uh, uh, my students stand up and count to eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, four, six, seven, eight. One, two, five, eight, one. Eight, one, and just count and let the time go. Now, by the way, um, um, I see you casually and sloppily putting on that capo. First time it was, I want, I want you guys to be, who here uses capos on their guitars? I want you guys to be careful with this. Putting it in, getting it nice and, um, and set on evenly and just go. <laughs>
My parents kind of checked out being parents for a while, and um, I, uh, so I, I had to kind of uh, figure out how to um, discipline myself. And I started on my Uncle Jeff's guitar, and um, my Uncle Jeff was a musician that I don't remember because he he like he died in a car accident. It was just like very tragic. He was really young, and I never and I, I don't know. And, and so I started playing I started playing guitar on his guitar. Um, and the weirdest thing was uh, inside of um, the guitar case there were all these notes and stuff, you know, of, of lyrics and songs that were never finished. And a lot of like these notes were written out to someone named Jess. And I was like. <laughs> what is that? I asked my dad, and he's like, "Oh, it was his girlfriend at the time." Apparently, but like, how how weird was it to like open that case and be like, like Jess, like I loved you, like you know? And I'm just like, <laughs> Dad, <laughs> you know? Livingston Taylor probably mm, probably the best teacher I've ever had. He's just an adorable human being who, who I, I think an awful lot of people have loved Livingston. You know, you get that feeling that he's allowed just enough of the right people close to him so that he's, he has trust about humanity or toward, toward a lot of the people that he's chosen to inhabit his life. He's a softy. He wouldn't want you to know that. But he's a, he's a curmudgeon. Uh, to my mind, the amazing thing about him is that uh, what a professional he is. And I say this as another professional. Uh, if you have never seen Livingston Taylor in concert, you've missed something. It took you a long time to get in time together, to get grooved together. I want you to... Is that okay for you? <clears throat> you can uh, very hard to keep that right. the, those uh, those feet cranking when you're when you're up on this stool. My name is Nick Vane. Uh, last week I performed this song also uh, for the first time. Um, it's an original song of mine. It's a candid response to um, rejection, I guess, uh, for for someone who's all too used to hearing it. Too many talks after class To know where this one's going I've had too many broken hearts To know how this one ends I've had too many tell you laters And unrequited loves To know unequivocally That I'm out of luck Livingston's class has been a big influence for me in performing as well as writing. From the writing standpoint, it causes me to look more deeply, more detailed at my lyrics to make sure they make sense, make sure they're, um, they have continuity to them. You're feeding me the same old lines. I've got too many IOUs to know. There will be no you and I. I just wanted to talk for a second. How, how will you guys how will you have money later on? When you're young and your tax load is low, I suggest an, uh, a Roth IRA early. And I don't, but people who actually know about this stuff do. But there is something else that I wish you would write down. When you invest, you can write down or hold in your brain this phrase. Broad-based, no load, index funds and guys when you do it at your age you cannot believe how much money you'll have i get lost crossing the street and i can't find my own treat but i love my baby and she thinks i'm sweet i must be doing something 
when you get to be my age. Gee, these things make a lot of money. Uh, I think what's interesting to me is, is the contrast between his art and his interest in science. Being a, a lay person who doesn't know much about aviation, I always say to him, well, wouldn't you be safer in a two-engine plane instead of a one-engine plane? Because if that engine dies, you got no backup. And he loves to say that the purpose of the second engine in a two-engine plane, when the first one goes out, is to fly you to the scene of the crash. <laughs> he made me a, a lovely little steam engine one time, you know, as a birthday gift. It was a little steam tugboat. And he had bothered to take the time to sit down and assemble this this very elaborate steam-powered tugboat. It was absolutely charming. But also, um, you know, knew all about the origins of steam and, and the, the original uh, 18th century uh, mill worker who had created that. I have not been in Livingston's plane, but I would have if I flew. I don't like to fly. But if I did, it would be with Livingston. I'm getting on my plane, you ready? You know, I'm flying into Martha's Vineyard. I hadn't even planned to go to Martha's Vineyard. I was like, okay, bye guys to my band and just jumped on his plane, right? But he doesn't tell me it's a three hour flight and there's no bathroom. And he, you know, has this huge thermos of coffee, which we're drinking and we're, you know, he's like, take the wheel. And then I'm like taking the wheel and I don't, I've never flown an airplane before. And I'm, you know, flying an airplane and I'm like, this is crazy. We're all, you know, crazy with caffeine. And, um, so he says, you know, take the wheel. I've got to, I've got to use the the thermos. So he has this like big Tupperware like thing of uh, you know Tupperware piece. I don't even know what it was called. And he, you know, turns around and, and pees in this Tupperware. And you know, I'm laughing. I'm like, that's disgusting, Liv. That's ridiculous. But then, like 20 minutes later, I'm like, I need the Tupperware. And so I use the Tupperware, but basically I filled it and never lived it down. Like my uncle was like, she filled the Tupperware. This is my favorite niece. I say to my students all the time, you be careful. Tell stories in your songs and in your art that are compelling because otherwise you become the story. Livingston Taylor takeaways are this this uh, piece of paper that he hands out at the end of a semester with all the quotes that he usually says. I tend to repeat things a lot and emphasize the same point from the first class to the last. Uh, my favorite Livingston Taylor takeaway is your parents didn't have you. They had sex and you showed up. <laughs> I was all over that like buzzards on a meat wagon, or she folded like a pair of twos. And he's got thousands of these that he can break out on a moment's notice. Livingston and I, in some ways, uh, feel like brothers. We, we, we recognize each other. You know, fa different families, both um, in this crazy music business for a lot of years, both loving to perform, and uh, yeah. As if I needed another brother, I got one. <laughs> but you know, when I see him, you know, he'll pull up in his um, 1950s BMW sidecar, you know, a motorcycle with a sidecar and stuff, and goggles on. It's uh, quite a picture, you know. So he is definitely an original. To be able to do what I do, to fly airplanes, to drive motorcycles, to have this freedom, I have given up some uh, very important things that other people have. I, for instance, have no children. And to not have done that gives me other freedoms, gives me a certain detachment, but there is a real 
reservoir of sadness in that reality. It's a trade that some people choose to make. Um, I'm able to own my broken heart. That heartache and deep sorrow will not visit every To me, my job is to be on the adventure. I see myself as a forward scout. Livingston Taylor with a scouting report. He has uh, 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 those old westerns where you have the army and the scout for the army. I'm the scout for the army. You have to be proactive. And again, uh, there's a song I wrote, favorite song of mine, it's called Step by Step. And it's a gospel song, and it's a, one of these uh, big paint the barn red gospel songs. And, uh, and, and the, the core of that song, it says, step by step. I'm walking my way to Canaan. That's, um, uh, that's the opening line in it. This idea that if you want to be someplace, start walking. And there's a phrase I like, uh, do not let the uh, perfect stand in the way of the completed. Finish things, get things done. Um, the, finish the song. You will write the perfect song if the gods align, if the stars align and the gods smile favorably, perhaps you will write the perfect song. But get started. Go. Just walk. Um, walk where you, you want to go. We're also going to be doing a little performance later on with a few of the students and uh, would love it if you're free to just uh, come on by. One, two, three, and... Eight hours with the shovel in the city summer sun. Taking arms, dusty boots, and the job that won't get done. Two weeks' pay spent yesterday in a free change bus ride home. The fading gray of a long, hard day, not a thing to call your own. And the boy turns and he asks his old dad, he says, Are you glad for the kind of life you've had? And he says, Life is good. Spring is in the air You got two bucks in your pocket A little bit of real green in your hair Life is good When you're proud of what you do Giving your all to brothers And it all comes back Pick a 
yourself up, you dust yourself off, and it didn't hurt at all. Life is good when you're proud of what you do. Give your all to other. Come on now, try. Listen very closely to every laugh inside. Maybe there's a reason. Giving your all to others and it all comes back to you. Are you following how this works? Good. Got back to reality. My faults belong to me. I got rid of the grudge. Took my medicine from the judge. Got rid of the booze and dope. Cleaned my mouth with a little soap. Got a job at the corner store. Paid my debts and a little bit more. Got a copy of the good book. Opened it up. Took a look. Said, Never my natural slave. Got the church and I got saved. Step by step. I came back to Jesus. Step by step, he opened up and let me in. The power of his love was the promise from above. And step by step, Satan cannot win. Do not think this means pain is gone away. That heartache and deep sorrow will not visit every day. But Satan has no weapon. No arrow, knife, or sword That'll take away the love of Jesus Christ of the Lord Step by step He was walking right beside us Oh, step by step He was with us all the way From the moment of our birth He had the measure of our work And he's walking us home to judgment day of our birth, he had the measure of our work, and he's walking us home to judgment. Got a little question for me. Are you ready to take yourself a little step by step? Are you ready to take yourself a little step by step? Huh? Are you ready to take yourself a little step? Bye.